Whenever I want to find out what's happening in Las Vegas entertainment, I have two options. One is to call 10 contacts on the strip. Now, five years ago, five of the 10 would call me back and give me news. Now I'm lucky if one calls me back. So I've been in town a long time, but it doesn't matter. My other option is better, and that's to pick up the Las Vegas Review Journal and read page three. That's because my guest and friend, John Katzlamidas, is the man about town whose cat's column runs daily in the RJ and keeps us all, including me, informed. Uh, oh, yes, and if I call Katz, he actually will call me back. So that's also good. And Kat has a new podcast coming up, which we're going to talk about as well, called Mobbed Up. We'll get into that. And you can follow John at ReviewJournal.com and as well as uh, X, Instagram, and Facebook. And Katz, welcome back to the show. Good to see you, Ira. Same here. So are you ever going to write a book? Uh, boy, have I been asked that a lot lately. I know. Uh, I just I, came into my head and I thought, you know no, what? No, you're right, man. I think we've talked about this over the years, too. I, I should. Um, I will tell you that that has become... Um, a, a highly discussed topic. It's something, and here's where I land on this. I have well more than enough material to do multiple books. I would have to stop doing what I'm doing now to write a book. And I'm still involved in the <laughs> yes. a gathering of information that would make a good book. So I, I can only do, you know, one thing effectively at a time. And right now it's being the daily columnist for the review journal and building a multimedia position here in Las Vegas still. That's what I'm doing. So, but down the line, I think you'll see that. Yes. Yeah. I think there's so many stories that you could write about and, and so many people and fascinating events you've been to that I think that could work. Now you said you can only do one thing at a time. I had a laugh because you're not just doing one thing. It's everything. Well, you yeah. Offer. yeah. It's as you said, it's multimedia. So you're, you're mm -hmm. on all these platforms as well as writing the daily column. And I always ask you this question, and I think it's a legitimate question to always ask is, when do you sleep? Wow, I bet I, uh, <laughs> the book question and the sleep question right off the top. <laughs> I say I sleep uh, not enough maybe to be healthy, but more than you would think. So it's probably six hours a night. Uh, okay. Usually down down by two, up by eight, down by one, up by seven kind of routine. Okay. And I'm I'm up and running when I get up too. But when you take a little time off to go back to the Midwest, do you are you totally disconnected at that point? In other words, you're not writing, you're you're with family, and are you turning off the phones? Are you not writing? No, or it's are become, you cheating a little bit? What's happening? I, <laughs> my, well, my family's in the Intermountain West, the Northwest of Idaho, so um, I might have to go actually to the Midwest to get away from them too. <laughs> um, but yeah, my family's in Idaho. So when I go away, and I did this a couple months ago, I uh, I go to Lava Hot Springs, Idaho, where my dad has a bed and breakfast, which which is just outside of Pocatello, Idaho. It's a Lava Hot Springs, a town of about 400 people. Pocatello is my original hometown. My father lives there. I've got a couple cousins, and you know, a few cousins who live in Pocatello. The rest of my family, my immediate family, lives in Boise. My brother, sister in law, nephew, mom, aunt. You know, so when I go to Idaho. The idea is for me to set everything down. You know, I don't always succeed at that. But the last trip, I was able to to really put everything away and just be the son and the brother and the nephew and right. you know, real that, life, that, the, the uncle. Um, but yeah, it's real tough, life. You know, <laughs> one thing I that I've noticed over the years is when I go to Idaho for the winter. You know, I'm there for the holidays. Uh, and I visit my father and, and I stay at the hot springs and I'm there and I'm in a completely different environment. I usually do a, a column. I usually write a column from that environment. I started doing it like in 2008, I think, and, you know, like a Hallmark card from, from Idaho. Yeah. That column gets more attention probably than anything I write uh, over the course of a year as far as uh, traditional stories. And uh, they like reading about the other side of the of the world. You know, it's very homey, very Hallmark like, and uh, so that's part of what I do when I'm in Idaho. So that requires me to work a little bit. Right. But uh, you know, the people around me by now, when I go to Lava Hot Springs in December, and but at the Lava Hot Springs in my dad's place, they know me now as the person who's George's son, who is the writer. They and they they're keeping their eye on me, seeing if I'm like chronicling what's going on 
<laughs> around town. They come up and talk to me and they ask me, when's the column going to be out? And I usually write it and then I split and I go to Boise the next day. <laughs> um, but it's it's a very, very uh, interesting, uh, it's a completely opposite. You know how Rita Rudner said, uh, and others have said this too, but I remember Rita Rudner saying it. No, no matter where you're from, Las Vegas is the opposite of it. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And Lava Hot Springs is definitely that. It's completely diametrically opposite of Las Vegas. So people like seeing the, uh, the yeah. coverage of that. They like that environment. And your family says an alien among among us now. We have to be careful. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know what? It's funny. I remind the novelty of me is worn off a long time ago in my family. It's just like I go up there and I'm just <laughs> You know, mom's mom's. Like, you want to go uh, rake the backyard? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Help me clean the garage. You know, and it, it's right. just like you're you're back in the you're back in the <laughs> in the slot there where you you grew up, kind of. And um, I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. Well, I had a bunch of cosmic questions for you, but we have to start out. I think with I slightly referenced it in the intro, which is you have a new podcast series coming with which is called Mobbed Up. So tell us a little bit about that. Mobbed Up is the third season of uh, uh, this next season is the third season of Mobbed Up that I'm hosting. We have two seasons in the bank. Uh, the first was about uh, ex gangster and now the late Frank Collada. The second was the history of the Aladdin Hotel Casino on the Strip. This season is all about Oscar Goodman, and I have uh, interviewed Oscar uh, extensively at the Plaza at Oscar's Steakhouse. And we have edited and distilled all that material into eight episodes that are all about Oscar Goodman and all of his, uh, you know, his notorious clients, his famous cases, why he ran for mayor, his relationship, uh, you know, with some of the people he's represented, his family, how this all affected his family. We interviewed uh, mayor, current mayor Goodman, Carolyn, and uh, some of the people he butted heads with over the years. And that uh, is going to premiere September 14th, the first episode. And that's all about Jimmy Chagra, the Jimmy Chagra case who um, Oscar had represented, who was involved in, who was pro probably the biggest marijuana deal dealer in the United States at the time when uh, Oscar was representing him. And he, uh, Chagra had to, was a figure in the, the uh, assassination of Judge uh, John Wood in San Antonio, Texas, back in 1978. It's a wild story. While Jack Sheehan, the author, is making, trying to make a movie out of this currently and um so that's the first episode and that comes out september 14th and then eight weeks mm -hmm. along uh, from there will they be able to get that at re reviewjournal.com yes yes okay, and everywhere you get everywhere you get podcasts okay. excellent there. that's where its home base is on our site okay excellent what's uh, the most and this is the question i was going to originally start out with which what's the most important change you've seen on the las vegas strip in the last couple of years from your perspective um, I would say in the in the most recent, but probably the last couple of years, and this touches entertainment, of course, but I think it's it's the um, the Super Bowl coming to Las Vegas, Formula One coming to Las Vegas, and the development of the Sphere. Those happened all within the last couple of years or so. Uh, obviously, Formula One puts um, Las Vegas on the international stage. That's going to be a lot of uh, prominence across multiple. Uh, areas, multiple cultures, including entertainment during that week. Uh, the Sphere is um, stands alone as a unique uh, performance entertainment venue. There's nothing else like it in the world. It's going to open this month with U2 and a sh show built for the Sphere. There's a great deal of uh, conversation and buzz created by that uh, venue, largely because of the exosphere, what they call the exosphere, that display on the outside. Right, the external view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a Super Bowl, you know, we're obviously we know you have the Super Bowl entertainment uh, going on the week of the game and during the game uh, in Las Vegas. And that is a huge move and a, a, a massive development for Las Vegas, because, you know, we both know that uh, and remember a time when Las Vegas was not the darling of the NFL by any stretch. We couldn't even get a commercial on the during the game less than 20 years ago. Now the game is here. So I think those are the big things, uh, you know, kind of that affect entertainment. But over the past, I would say, decade, I think the biggest change is the um, is is the advent of theater residencies in Las Vegas. 
Um, I would say what Celine Dion started in the early 2000s has just exploded. And everybody who is a, every major superstar, it seems, wants to have some sort of uh, extended engagement in Las Vegas. We have six major theaters. I just was at Lady Gaga last night uh, at Dolby Live at Park MGM. She is excited. She has showing no signs of wanting to leave Las Vegas. And, you know, look around. Adele, Bruno Mars, Miranda Lambert, uh, Keith Urban, Garth Brooks, um, you know, all doing residencies. Uh, Sting, uh, you know, Usher. And uh, that uh, a decade ago, even, was not happening in Las Vegas. A decade ago, the only other real extended engagement residency headline we had in Las Vegas, other than like Rod Stewart and Elton John and Celine at the Coliseum was Britney Spears at Planet Hollywood. And now it's it's a huge Katy Perry, Carrie Underwood, Keith, uh, uh, Luke Bryan. The list goes on and on. Those are all over at Park or at uh, Doris World. So those, we have major superstars in a way coming here repeatedly that we didn't have before. What's the appeal to the entertainers for having a residency here? Is it because they don't have to travel and they just can go to be in Las Vegas, stay here, and the people come to them? Is that the main draw? Yeah, that's mainly it. Yeah, they say it's more convenient. You know, you talk to somebody like, uh, you know, I've talked to like ZZ Top, Billy Gibbons, for example, who does have a home here, but he says, you know, it's a real convenience to just be able to go to the hotel and do the show and be home, you know, or, right. or be at the hotel for an extended period of time. John Fogarty says the same thing. We have Carlos Santana, who's also lives here and does his, his residency at House of Blues. That's a big, uh, it's a very convenient uh, option for them especially if you've been touring so much you know we have people who go all over the world and when they stop touring they still want to perform right so they like being being able to do eight shows in a month somewhere and just be there you know it's and and uh it's profitable and they can build specific shows for las vegas you know a lot of a lot of time in most cases the only way you can see katie perry's play show or katie perry at all right now is that resorts world and she's built a show specific for las vegas a lot of them do this. Gwen Stefani, you know, did this, and uh, Gaga with jazz and piano. Garth Brooks, you know, they built shows and productions specifically for here that can be that can sit here for a period of time, and they like doing that. You can get really creative. All of them have some sort of Las Vegas specific element or an entire show uh, themed for Las Vegas. I was thinking about what you said earlier, and it seems as if Formula One is be will become a an annual residency for a while. So even mm -hmm. non performer related events are going to become ongoing events here in Los Angeles. Yeah, the, the race will be 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky so, us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <I> hope it. <laughs> speaking, speaking of that, with the, having not so much the race, but the roads of the race and getting back to the strip, you are all over town every night, every day. Have you noticed? because I notice it and I try to avoid it as much as possible, is the traffic and parking. And uh, I'm sure you've got systems worked out and we've talked about this in the past, but mm -hmm. for most people going to a property on the strip, especially on a weekend, it's not as much fun as it used to be. I remember it being a lot easier to go see a show. Now I have to contemplate traffic, parking, walking from the parking lot or valet parking to the showroom or the convention area and then yeah. it afterwards and that it's a lot of stuff that you have to do and it's not necessarily easy traffic is worse uh, and more problematic and more complicated today than it's ever been in las vegas for me you know i've been here since 96 um i, I there's a, it's just the problem is that there's there are multiple projects going on at the same time mm -hmm. you know it's not all Formula One. There are projects going on elsewhere around the valley that are just have been planned. I live downtown. It's hard to move around down here. You know, if you go, you know, <laughs> you try to go west on Charleston, west on Sahara, you're going to run into road work. You, you know, it's everywhere, east side of uh, yeah. of the valley as well, uh, and up north, everywhere, everywhere. And uh, I, I can only say that um, our our thought about this is. It's, part of growth it's part of a city that is still 
maturing really in a lot of ways, uh, growing and, and handling the infrastructure of what it wants to do in terms of um, tourism opportunity and in terms of an increasing population. Um, I, I will be glad when it's over. And as far as the F1 is concerned, what I've been saying is at the end of this, we need to ask ourselves, really, was this worth it? You know, let's talk a few weeks after F1 and really do a gauge of what it meant to live in Las Vegas as this is being built. We're turning our major, you know, <laughs> our major thoroughfare in the city into a racetrack. Was that a good idea? But did everybody benefit how they thought they would? We need to make sure that that was, that we can answer that effectively. Otherwise, we're going to look like, we were a mark, you know, and we just said yes to everything. Yeah, we're a can-do um, but... city, and there's a public-private partnership that always makes things mm -hmm. happen. But as you yeah. said, that's a very good point. Do, let's look at some of the stuff, and is it, does it is it worthwhile in the long run for everybody to be able to do all these things, including, and I'll bring it up now too, is do we want to get rid of the Tropicana in order to have a baseball stadium? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't like the site. Personally, I don't like the side. I, I think getting a major league baseball team is a noble cause. And I think that we're, de we're destined to have it here in Las Vegas. I don't know. We both know that property very well. Of course you work there. Um, I, uh, I just don't, I don't know if that's the right idea for that nine acres to put a major league baseball team there. You know, this is the strip is already sort of, you know, it's got a lot going on. It's already a, a massively uh, concentrated street. And to put a baseball stadium there, I want to see the traffic and parking plan that works for that, first of all. And what and how that, uh, another one, how that's going to benefit everybody who lives in Las Vegas. You know, I've long said, uh, and, and this has been talking to the Goodmans, that there wasn't enough uh, review of the Cashman site in downtown Las Vegas, where Cashman Stadium was, where the 51s and Stars played. That already has parking uh, it built in. Exactly. Nobody was talking about that spot. You know, it's not the strip. It's not as sexy a view, maybe. But it would gentrify that area in a big way, in my view, the same way that uh, China Basin was affected by the, the Giants Ballpark, Oriole Park and, and Camden Yards in Baltimore, that type of place. They could build a gorgeous facility, a lot more territory, built-in parking, downtown Las Vegas, a good, uh, you know, freeway access nearby. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just never was talked about. It wasn't talked about for the Raiders and it wasn't talked about here for the A's. You know, I don't know why that is, uh, other than it's just that people like being on the strip. You know, they prefer that vantage point. But, right. you know, what do I know? I just went downtown. You know, <laughs> yes, but downtown's evolving and changing. And that's an excellent point, and especially the land and the building is owned still, I assume, by the LVCBA, Las Vegas Convention of Visitors. I think so. Yeah. Right. And that could have been part of that discussion with the with the A's about, hey, well, what about this area here? You're absolutely right. And it ties in so closely, not only to downtown Las Vegas, but elements of downtown, Fremont Street experience, yeah. Fremont Street East, et cetera. That could really, as you say, gentrify that part of the, the neighborhood. And it's right next to the state building. So it yes, there's an all yeah. kinds of great possibilities there. Oh, I, I yeah. had many conversations with Oscar Goodman about this. Um, I think it was as Carolyn was campaigning maybe around that time. And he, he, they both believe this, you know, obviously they're downtowners, but right. um, I, uh, I don't know. We have a soccer team playing there now, the lights at, at the old Catherine field, but I'm talking about taking down that stadium, right. building something that makes sense and, uh, and can be a benefit, really a benefit to this, this whole community. Yeah. No, that's a great idea worth exploring. I hope they do. The, I, I don't think I've ever asked you this question before, but is there one person or maybe two people, three who influenced you the most in terms of deciding a on a writing career and b specifically in the world of entertainment because you're a great writer i knew you before you went into the entertainment beats exclusively mm -hmm. as right. so you covered things in depth in a lot of different ways was there one person that influenced you on a on the writing career and two then going into the entertainment side of it exclusively for at least for now you know i think um as far as writing, uh, you know, as a career, uh, you know, <laughs> this goes back to when I was living in Chico, California, and uh, I was a uh, just coming out of high school. I was one of these, the guy, I guess, not one of the guys, one, the guy who came right out of high school and went into his career. Um, 
I had a, a, a person by the name of David Little, who was a sports writer in Chico, California, who covered us as athletes when we were in you know, Pleasant Valley High School in Chico, California, which is where Aaron Rodgers went to high school, by the way, his same high school, the Packers, his family's from up there a lot later than I did, or a lot earlier than I did. And I, I only knew that I had writing ability and I loved uh, sports and I loved telling stories. That was pretty much it. And uh, David had known me, he was a sports writer who covered us. And he said there was an opening at the, at the local paper, Chico Enterprise Record. And if I would want to come down and, and uh, apply for it. So I did, this was three months after I graduated from high school. And I got that job the lowest rung on the local paper and I was covering community sports and I loved it. And that was the real, you know, we had the sports editors were friends of my family and every, I knew the community so well. And that was how I got into writing professionally, simply. And I just <laughs> kept <laughs> come from the bottom, you know, this is like an entertainment, they call it, you know, yeah, it's the best way to do the, it. The midnight lounge gig kind of, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then when I got, and later on in my career, when I started, um, I, you know, I was working at the Las Vegas Sun at the time. I exhausted my sports writing career at the at the Review Journal in those days. In 1996, I moved here in 98. I left and came over to the Sun, and I was doing general assignment stuff. But I think, um, you know, the per a person who really helped steer me in the entertainment direction and the A and E direction was um, Steve Bornfeld, was the A and E editor of the Las Vegas Sun at the time. And uh, he and I was a, an associate editor and a, a general writer. He said, "You have a real knack for, uh, you have a feel for entertainment that's important." He said, "You could see that I I was really I took to that particular subculture, you know." And uh, so we started mo moving in that direction. Yeah, and I became the A and E editor, okay. mad about town, and you know the whole thing happened organically. But it was that at that point when you know when I was working with Steve mostly. Um, and another another person who was really instrumental in this whole thing with the Cats column, it was called the Cats Report, was actually Rob Curley, who was a, what, the guy we hired to be the digital editor at Greenspun Media Group. And then, you know, they found out that I was writing so many things and across so many different platforms. They finally said, why don't you just take everything that you do and put it in one place, give it a name and go for it. And that was kind of Rob's, Rob had that idea uh, with me in 2009 and I said okay so we started the cast report in, in February 2009 and after that everything was just it just took off it just it went nuts and uh, that's what I've been doing ever since but uh, you know it's a, it's an interesting path there's no there's no template for to make it where I am right now there's no right you know <laughs> yeah, well, I, then, I can't see anybody else doing it <laughs> well also what happened too is once you started covering it on that beat that's when multimedia exploded or multi-platforms exploded. So you were not just writing, you were also shooting video, you were also doing audio, and you were doing the podcast that we talked about, uh, other podcasts besides mm -hmm. the, uh, the mob podcast. Podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And the, uh, sorry, podcasts, say that three times real fast. Yeah, podcasts is the other one. We want to bring yeah. that back, by the way, podcasts and still enforcing podcasts. But yeah, good. We did, that. we did that for two and a half years, more than 100 episodes now. Yeah. Right. The uh, But you were doing all these different platforms at the same time. So when you were covering an event or a, a performance, you weren't just there to review it and write about it. You were also, sometimes you were you were live on Twitter or Facebook or yeah. mm -hmm. other platforms. And then you were also collecting video for other presentations. And then you were appearing on local TV stations, talking about different, I mean, you were everywhere. You still are everywhere. This is why I ask you whether you sleep, because <laughs> <laughs> we were out last night. You'll get it, you'll get a kick out of this. Letter. We were out last night. I was out last night with uh, Al Bernstein, my buddy, the boxing broadcaster. Oh yes, right. We went out. We went to see Lady Gaga last night, right? And during the day, I had to write. Um, I was doing writing most of the day, and I had to write uh, and break the story about our friend Geechee Guy passing away. Right, I read that. Yes. And, Sorry yeah, and, you know, terrible thing, and uh, so. I finished that off and we go to see uh, Lady Gaga. We have dinner before and then we see the Gaga show. And we were so, I was burned out last night from the whole day mm -hmm. with Geechee and all that coverage. And Al wasn't feeling it either. So we decided not to go to the post show, which is Brian Newman after dark. And that Brian Newman is Lady Gaga's band leader. And he's kind of like a, the modern day Louis Prima of Las Vegas. He, he's great. He's he been a guest on the show. Yeah, he's very good. 
You know him, yeah. Yeah, he's excellent. And uh, and so he does that after dark show and it gets out at about three in the morning, 2.30 or three. And I'm like, right. not, we both said we can't do this tonight. Well, right. I go and I get on TV today and do local TV on the CW at eight o'clock and I'm doing my thing. Well, between that time, when we left the hotel and I started on, on, uh, on Channel 3 today, Lady Gaga herself showed up at Brian Newman last night. Uh -huh. And we decided not to go. So one night, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I'm like, it usually nine times out of 10, this is true. It's been about nine out of 10. I'm there when Gaga's there. This is the first time I've not been there when she's walked into that room. I've timed it perfectly. So <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is it's a participation sport. You yes. know, <laughs> you really do have to get out and get, get, you know, get up and get out. And, um, you know, at some point I'll, I'll, I'll figure that the quality of life needs to be adjusted. But I mean, I've got the best job in journalism, I think. Oh, you know, absolutely. Why do, yeah. Why do I want to? Las Vegas? You know, it's what else? You can, yeah, it's great. Right. I mean, why do I want to screw that? So, um, but you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you do make up, allowances. Yeah, but still, you sit, you never seem to look exhausted, which I'm always fascinated by that. Every time I see you, it's like, how does he do that? He's, he's <laughs> he seems to be everywhere. <laughs> and, he, and he has to write about it, too. And then That's get, the key thing. Yeah, it, it's just crazy. It, it, but you do it. So that's good. So uh, uh, one last question before I let you go. And this is a tough question, but if you had to pick one or two of the top entertainers you really enjoy the most, could you narrow it to one or two or is it impossible? Uh, to Just to, to interview or to observe? Oh, uh, just um, to, to watch. To, yeah, to watch from your own perspective that in terms of the, the, your favorite entertainers to watch, enjoy, and write about. How about that? Well, okay, well it's kind of tilted because I just, I've just seen her so much recently. But Gaga's show, that jazz and piano show, right, it's is really is really fine. And if you yeah. ever have a chance to see Adele, yeah, the color, and do that too. I love Garth good. Brooks. Garth is amazing. Um, but I'm telling you, I love a good small cap performance too. Clint Holmes, uh, Earl Turner, Santa Fe and the Fat City Horns, Frankie Moreno. Um, you know, Frankie Perez uh, here in Las Vegas. I could go on on. David Perico and the Raiders house band. Hello, David and that outfit. Las Vegas players kill it with the Raiders and in different forms around town. I have as much fun at those types of shows. There are many others. You know, my girlfriend, Steph Payne, is incredible. Um, th those types of shows um, uh, make me as happy as being at Gaga or being at Adele, really. I saw Beyonce recently amazing amazing artist i saw taylor swift unbelievable um big rock and roll fan you know i love the aerosmith residency um but you know give me a good killer las vegas club or lounge gig and i'm happy you know, and i really. think that's a secret to your success is that you accept and enjoy all kinds of entertainment to not just write about but to really as i mentioned enjoy it and interact with and that's, I think, the secret. You don't simply limit yourself to big acts. It's all the acts and all the yeah. things. And, you know, if they're good, they're good no matter where they are. That's right. These guys are world class. Santa Fe's horn section is Lady Gaga's horn section. The Santa yeah. Fe guys are in that show. Lon Bronson's coming up, another one. I mean, these guys are world class players. You might not know their names, but they they bring it. And, and uh, Adele has a whole bunch of string players from Vegas. Yeah. You know, Michael Buble hired a bunch of singers of Michelle Johnson contracted here in town. It goes on and on, you know. Yeah. Well, um, so that, I'm that bridge, and and Newman is that way too. He knows the bridge too between right. you know a listers and what he does. We're both about that, connecting all those parts. And uh, you know, there are many others, but but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about uh, it, top to bottom. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been John Katzlamitas, Cats, the man about town. His column runs daily in the Las Vegas Review Journal. Don't forget, he's got that mobbed up podcast coming. He also has the column that comes out daily at page three at reviewjournal.com. And you can follow him on X and Instagram and even on Facebook. Katz, thanks for being on the show. Always a pleasure, Ira. Thanks for having me. See you next time.